guys. Day two of remote learning. Um, hopefully this one goes a little bit better than the last one I just tried to record. It's currently storming at my house and I got rained out mid-lecture for you guys. Um, now though I'm on the front porch so hopefully it's not going to get too bad. Um, if we're looking at the remote learning packet for you guys, we're going to be on, uh, this is going to be your lesson for the 8th which is gonna be Wednesday. Um, we're gonna go through slides 50 through 67 and you're gonna have an assignment. You're also, don't forget, we're gonna try to finish this assignment from last class. Um, and I'll end up posting a review guide for y'all to look at and work through on Friday. I'm not gonna end up actually posting a test because I can't grade the test. There's no point in me giving it to you guys. So I'll just end up posting the review guide. I definitely recommend y'all looking over it so that you can try to pick out the important pieces of information that we went over for this unit. Um, but if we look at the PowerPoint, um, we're gonna finish it up today um, with external parasites. So we did internal parasites yesterday. Um, tapeworms, ringworms, ringworms, roundworms, um, stuff like that. So today we're going to do external parasites, meaning they're going to live on the outside of the animal's body, uh, in the hair coat, on the skin. Some of them, like ear mites, can live in the ears, but they're going to live generally in the outside of the body. And I do quotes because of in the ears is still considered outside of the body. They're not like in the digestive system. So first one up is fleas, just because they're super common almost all animals end up getting fleas at some point in their life. Uh, if you've seen fleas, which I'm guessing we all have, they're these little reddish brown, wingless, hard-shelled external parasites. And they seem really, really fast because they jump from place to place rather than running or moving. Like ticks are very slow creatures. Fleas, they're really fast. If you don't get them on that first grab off your animal, you're probably not gonna find them because they're gonna end up burrowing somewhere else in the animal's hair. And there they go. Fleas, they feed on the animal's blood, which can end up leading to things like anemia, um, skin irritation, scabs, because the flea bites and they drink the blood, which then causes the animal to itch. They start scratching. And even after the flea moves, they end up, it still be, ends up being itchy. And they end up scratching and scratching and scratching. Some animals are actually allergic to the saliva of fleas to the point that when a flea bites, it's gonna remain itchy for like an entire day or so. Just that one spot where they got bit once. Um, so you're gonna see itching, you're gonna see scratching, you can see a decrease in activity depending, like if they're very invested with fleas and end up developing anemia, then they're not gonna have all this like healthy blood just flowing through their body that allows them the energy to be able to move. You can do all different kinds of treatment. Um, you can do spot-ons where you can just like pick them off. You can do topical treatment, which will end up killing the fleas. Um, or you can do like environmental control where you go out and you put down like a pesticide or insecticide and just get the fleas gone so that your dog can walk around and they shouldn't be coming into contact with fleas. So different things that animals can get from fleas. Um, flea allergy dermatitis. This is what I was talking about where they're allergic to the saliva of the flea. Um, you're going to see them itching and scratching a lot more than you would expect an animal to itch with fleas to the point that they're going to be biting their skin and their skin's going to turn red. They're going to get scabs or bumps. They're going to scratch so much that they end up scratching hair out. Um, Flea prevention and treatment for animals suffering from flea allergy dermatitis, are, it's really important because this animal is severely uncomfortable. You can end up seeing anemia develop in animals with a flea infestation where these fleas are just drinking so much blood that the animal is losing more blood than it should on a regular day. Some fleas can also carry bacteria. Um, called the Bartonella bacteria. And this is, it's commonly found in cats with fleas. 
Um, the bacteria typically infects cats and it'll end up leading to feline infectious anemia. And it affects the animal's immune system, their red blood cells. Um, so all the more reason to make sure your animal is on some kind of flea preventative medicine. And then the last one, the plague. Um, the plague was caused by fleas that were on the rats that ended up getting infected and then peeing and pooping on everybody's food. And it was just kind of this chain reaction that all started with fleas that were carrying the plague. Ticks, ugh, they're gross. Um, so with ticks, they are arthropods, meaning they have eight legs, kind of like little spiders that like to drink blood. Um, ticks are really, uh, they're pretty common here in the South because they're an animal that seeks heat. So when it gets cold outside, they're really gonna start trying to come out and trying to get on anything that they can because just about anything is gonna be warmer than the environment. Um, you'll find them also in the summer because when we're around hiking in the summer, we're not wearing a lot of clothing. We're wearing like shorts and a tank top or something, which is a lot of skin that fleas, or sorry, not fleas, but ticks are gonna be able to get on and attach. So it's really easy to get flea, or I keep saying fleas, it's really easy to get ticks in the summer, especially if you're walking around in a place that could be, that's gonna be high in ticks, like the woods, like brush and bushes. There's a ton of different kinds of ticks. So the American dog tick, they can, they're the ones that transfer Rocky Mountain spotted fever. They're the ones that we need to worry about. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is, it's deadly. You're gonna see the fever because it's in the name. Joint pain, um, when it says depression, it's not actually like, oh, I'm depressed. It's like they don't have enough energy to be able to get up and to move around. Or anorexia, where they just, they're continuing to lose weight. Um, the deer tick or the, um, yeah, the deer tick. They are the ones that will typically transmit Lyme disease, and they're called the deer tick because commonly found on the deer. Um, the symptoms for Lyme disease are pretty similar to Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, where they both have joint pain, both depression, both anorexia. Um, both of them, you're going to see some fever. Um, in this case, you're always going to want to go and see a doctor your animals can also get these diseases. And then the last one, which is probably going to be, a rel it might be relatively new to you, is Babesia. And it's another disease carried by ticks. Um, typically, I think by the brown dog tick. And it's not a disease to like necessarily really worry about. If you find a tick and you start feeling these symptoms, which the symptoms are different. We've got anemia, we've got jaundice, which is really yellowing up the skin, um, fever, and vomiting. If you pull off a tick and like a day or two later, you're throwing up for some weird reason, and you've got a fever and your skin looks kind of yellow, you want to go to the doctor because they can treat it, but no one wants a tick, a tick-borne disease. Lice. Um, lice aren't super common in animals. Um, Primarily just because not many, like, you would have to come in contact with one animal that has lice, and your animal would have to get close enough that they would be able to transfer off the lice that are on them onto your animal. Um, but lice, they're wingless, they stick to the hair coat, they're very, very small and hard to see. Um, they have about a month's long life cycle and the eggs are called nits. So when you're brushing your dog, you use like a really, really, really fine tooth comb, almost like a flea comb, and you'll brush down all the way down to the skin, all the way down so that the hair comes up, and then you can look. If you see little white pieces on the comb that were like right on the layer of skin, then it could probably be nits or lice eggs. Um, as far as treatment, typically um, something like tea tree oil is going to be used. You want something thick to kind of smother the lice that are on the animal and more than likely a haircut.
So if your dog gets sliced and you have like a golden retriever or something, you're gonna wanna take them and get them shaved because it's a lot easier for you to brush them and get those knit eggs out if they don't have this really, really long hair that you're struggling to get down to the bottom of. Mosquitoes. Um, we talked about mosquitoes with heartworm virus, or um, heartworms. Um, mosquitoes, they're super common here in the South just because of our weather and our environment. Um, they're small flying insects, they survive on blood, obviously, and they can carry quite a few diseases outside of the heartworms. Um, people who own horses are also very concerned about things like the West Nile virus or equine infectious encephalitis, I think is the name of that. It's a long one. It's some type of encephalitis. Um, the West Nile virus and the encephalitis, they both, um, they're mosquito-borne disease and both of them cause inflammation and swelling to the brain. They're diseases that you, you your animal, your horse, like no one wants to end up having. Um, so when you have animals, you want to make sure that you have some kind of mosquito prevention or treatment going around. Like whether it's just like the tiki torches that will keep the mosquitoes away, whether it's um, lemongrass oil, keeping your animal inside. Um, you want to limit the mosquitoes that are able to get near your house and near you and your animals. Biting fleas are also an issue for people that have livestock because um, they can end up causing a lot of irritation. If you've ever like, been out swimming in the pool in the summer, growing up in the country, this was always like a big, I hated it because biting flies, they're huge. Like they're probably about the size of a quarter and you hear them coming and they're literally just looking to bite anything. They'll come, they would come up, me and my sister, we'd be swimming in the pool. We'd go down, we'd come up, and it's, I swear, it's like there's a biting file waiting. It would get us on the head, on the shoulder, like wherever it could. It was like when it landed, it bit, and you could feel it. Um, so biting flies, they cause a lot of irritation. That's part of the reason that we want like animals like cows and horses to have long tails, because their tail, that sole purpose of that tail is to be able to swat and get those animals, or get those flies off of them. Um, for horses, it takes like seven years for their tail to grow from being like a foot long down to the ground. So you like very rarely will you see horse owners cutting their horse's tails because they need that tail to be able to get flies off of them. Um, I read, I saw a post and I can't remember who it was by. It was, I think it was like a veterinary college or something but they had students doing research on why zebras had stripes because zebras they're in the horse family so why do zebras have stripes and horses don't and they found that zebras have they encounter fewer flies than horses do and the sole reason of that is because of their stripes so a lot of researchers are thinking that the reason zebras have stripes is to help help with like fly control um, so what they did to test this was they took those horses that were getting bitten by flies and they painted them black and white. They painted them with stripes and saw like a substantial decrease in how many flies were biting those animals because the stripes, for whatever reason, deter the flies from coming into contact with them. Um, with biting flies though, you, you want to use different fly sprays. When I was in high school, I worked at a horse farm. And when the woman ran out of fly spray, she made her own. And it was essentially like water and minty toothpaste. You want something like very strong and potent. And then you mix it into water to turn it into a spray. And you just spray it on your animal. They don't mind smelling minty. And it's a strong enough smell to keep the flies from wanting to come around. You also want to make sure you're removing any manure because that's what flies are wanting. Um, and biting flies can also transmit equine infectious anemia, which is different than the encephalitis I was talking about. Um, but 
equine infectious anemia, it's a viral disease. There's no vaccine, there's no cure. So there's no prevention, there's no treatment. Um, the only thing you can really do is to try to control the number of flies on your farm near your animals. For mites, um, there's a couple different kinds of mites that we're gonna go over. Um, and a lot of them live in different places. So ear mites, they live in the ears. Um, they're relatively common. If you have an animal that just like scratches its ear a lot, it's possible that they can have ear mites. Um, you'll see, if they do, you'll see like this black crusty ear wax. It looks like wax, but it's actually the mites in the animal's ears. Um, you wanna try to clean your animal's ears out. Animals with like big ears like basset hounds and beagles, they are more prone to getting ear mites because once those mites get in, their ear just kind of keeps them in there. It's like a big heavy flap that doesn't, it makes it difficult for the dog to get in and scratch the inside of their ear and it makes it difficult for the owner to be able to like lift up that ear and see if there's anything in their ear. So when you have animals with really big ears, that's something that you want to keep a check on. Mange mites, um, two different kinds that will end up, they can end up leading to mange. So the mites, external parasites, they live on the skin and in the hair. Um, the first one is the sarcoptic mite and they cause sarcoptic mange. Um, they will end up, they can cause scabies. They're very, very contagious. Um, like just by touching your animal, like just going and like scratching them. Like, oh, you're such a good boy. Da, da, da. Um, not something that you want to do with an animal that has sarcoptic mites. And demodactic mites. They're another mite. They live on the skin, um, but they're not very contagious. Um, Typically, most animals don't really have a problem with them. It doesn't really get to the point of where like hair starts falling out and they're profusely itchy and they're getting passed all around to all the other dogs in the family. Um, a lot of dogs, they're fine and it's not really an issue. Ringworm. Um, I feel like we talk about ringworm a lot. Um, ringworm, it's a fungus. It's not actually a worm. Um, and you'll end up getting you or your animal end up getting a ring somewhere on the body where the fungus is that will end up causing the hair to fall out and there will be a red ring. It'll be a little bit crusty in the middle and it's going to be itchy. Um, it is contagious and because it's a fungus it likes warm moist places. So you have to keep it open to the air. You don't want to wear like a band-aid over it or a patch over it, or keep like a bunch of gooey cream up there all the time. You want to be able to let it breathe because that's how that fungus is gonna dry out. Um, ringworm can be difficult to treat just because you, if you don't get every single bit of fungus, then it's just gonna come right back. Um, sanitation is also really important for fungal diseases because if your dog lays on the bed and they have red ringworm, that ringworm fungus is also on the bed. If you scratch them and you scratch white where their ringworm is, you're, you have that fungus on your hand and you can easily transfer it to wherever. So, um, oh, getting out of the parasites and into just a few like treatment options for different things. Um, deworming programs are programs for getting rid of internal parasites. Um, if you give a dewormer, it's typically like an oral, um, an oral liquid that you give to the animal and it flushes out their system because most internal parasites are gonna live in like the digestive system. So if you give it to them in the mouth, then that dewormer is gonna go all the way through their system and carry whatever's with it right on out. Um, small and large animals can be dewormed. Um, Internal parasites are really common for puppies. So puppies typically around like eight weeks old, they're gonna get dewormed right before they get sent off, maybe a week or so before they get sent off to their new owners. Just to make sure that they're not carrying fleas from owner number, or carrying internal parasites from owner number one over to owner number two. Large animals like 
cows and horses, and we can also include sheep and goats in this, they, they can end up being dewormed every six to eight weeks, um, depending on whether or not it's needed. The thing about deworming is that internal parasites build up resistance to dewormers. So if you use ivermectin every single time and you deworm your animals every six weeks on the mark, you're going to see less and less parasites getting out of your animal and less and less improvement in your animal's overall well-being. Because every time you give that same dewormer in like the same amount of time, the parasite builds up a resistance to it. So you can think, you're like, oh, I saw like X number of eggs last time, and I saw a less number here and a less number here. So that means my animal is getting healthier. No, it means that the parasites are building up a resistance and you probably have more than ever in your animal's system. And they're, they're way stronger than the original ones were. So even though you can deworm animals every six to eight weeks, or large animals at least, I definitely recommend that you only deworm when you have a good suspicion that they actually have worms. Otherwise, you're not doing anything than clearing out the animal system and helping to build up a resistance if they have any worms. Um, most internal parasites though, like if you have small animals, most internal parasites are going to be killed by heartworm prevention. So heartworm prevention is, it covers almost all of them. And your animals definitely should be on heartworm prevention to begin with. Oh, I'll go back. Um, so the last bullet, not all dewormers will kill every single parasite. Um, typically they're going to kill everything. They're going to kill like roundworms and coccidia and this and that. And then there's going to be like a specific one for tapeworms and then there might be a specific one for another kind of parasite. So when your animal has a, if they have parasites, you want to be sure of what kind of parasite they have so that you make sure you're getting the correct type of dewormer. Because if they have tapeworms and you're giving them the dewormer for roundworms, then it's not going to do any good. It's not going to get the tapeworms if that's what they have. Um, neoplasia, also known as cancer, um, is unfortunately pretty common in a lot of animals. And you can look at your animal and you can tell, or your animal can be perfectly healthy and you have no idea. Um, if they have some sort of cancer that you, you're able to see, you may see like swelling somewhere, you might see lesions or sores or tumors somewhere on the outside of the skin. If they have something internal, like if they have kidney cancer, you might not know that. If you're not looking for the symptoms, then you're probably not going to know that your animal has kidney cancer. Um, so you can look for sores that don't heal. If your animal, if they have fleas and they scratch themselves and they scratch themselves raw and they start bleeding and it takes a really long time for it to scab over and stop bleeding and that scab stays there for a really long time then that could be a sign that they have cancer because healing up that scratch should be a pretty easy thing for the body to do. But if they're having to divert all their resources to fighting cancer, then they're not going to have a whole lot of resources to like just repair this little scratch here. So you might see scratches or sores that take a longer time to heal. You can see weight loss, a loss of appetite, um, if they have, like, depending, some cancers will cause, like, a really nasty smell from their mouth. Um, and you can see depression. There's so many different types of cancer that it's just, it's crazy to think about. Um, for treatment, though, if someone is willing to treat their animal for cancer, it's very expensive. It's a lot to do, and it takes a lot out of the animal. It's just like treating a human for cancer the animal has to go through chemotherapy. 
um, if they have tumors or masses that need to get removed, then they're going to have to go into surgery to do that. They're going to have to go into radiation to try to kill the cancer cells and stop them from multiplying. Um, they do cryosurgery where they try to freeze it to stop it from growing. They'll do all kinds of different medications, different combinations of the above treatments, depending on what kind of cancer the animal has. Um, Mark's grandma, her dog had cancer. And I don't even remember what kind of cancer it was, but she spent like three years and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars trying to treat that dog for cancer. And he beat it like two or three times, but it always came back. So not a lot of people are going to have the money to be able to treat that animal for cancer or be willing to go through it and put their animal through treating cancer. Zoonosis, uh, that was a unit that we covered in animal science too. Zoonosis are, it's a classification of diseases that are transmitted from animals to humans. So ringworm is a really common example. That can be transmitted from animals to people. Um, most of them aren't super serious, but we are going to go over three that can be. Um, Toxoplasma gondii, that is the name for the bacteria that causes toxoplasmosis. Um, toxoplasmosis is found in cats. What ends up happening is your cat goes outside, it eats like a mouse or a rat or something, excuse me, that's carrying the Toxoplasma gondii. And then it becomes the host for the Toxoplasma gondii. Just like any parasite, it's going to be shed through the oocytes or through the feces, the eggs and the feces. Cats going in litter boxes have to be cleaned by a person. So, Women that are pregnant are especially prone to getting toxoplasma, toxoplasmosis because their body is already diverting all these resources to keeping the baby healthy and maybe not necessarily, and obviously not 100% is going to be going to her to keep her healthy. So if she comes into contact with that bacteria and she doesn't wash her hands, does, like, she breathes everything in, she accidentally gets some on her hands, doesn't go wash her hands, goes to eat something, and then she ingests it, then it can end up affecting her and the fetus, which it can be so critical to the point that it can end up causing an abortion. Um, cats can be carriers or the primary host for years. So, you it's just, let's chalk this up to another reason why your animal shouldn't be going outside and eating things like birds and mice and rats. Brucellosis. Um, brucellosis, it's, um, it's very common. I don't want to say very common. It's pretty common in cattle, and you can also find it in dogs. Um, brucellosis is a reproductive disease that can affect, it can affect any mammal. Um, but it's going to be contagious. It's going to be spread through bodily fluids. So it could be vaginal discharge. It could be semen. Um, it could be the placenta. Because what ends up happening is if the female gets it, her uterus will become inflamed. And if she's pregnant, it'll cause an abortion. And if you or, the, or another animal comes into contact with the vaginal discharge, the semen from the infected male dog, or the placenta, then they can end up developing brucellosis. Um, there is no treatment. The only thing that you can, animals are carriers for it for the rest of their life. So the only thing you can do is spay or neuter your dogs so that they can't pass it on. And then encephalitis. Um, encephalitis is also known as sleeping sickness. Ah, Eastern equine encephalitis or Western. Okay, so just equine encephalitis then. Um, it's called sleeping sickness. And like we said, um, it, if it causes inflammation in the animal's brain. It's common in horses. It can happen in dogs. It can happen um, to people. 
So it's spread by mosquitoes, our favorite little nasty creatures. There is no treatment, but there is a vaccine that can be given to prevent animals from getting it. Um, a lot of horse owners will definitely get that vaccine, but encephalitis isn't all too common in dogs and people. Um, typically, for, whatever, for one reason or another, it's just going to be found in horses that aren't vaccinated, or at least that's where I've heard most of the cases coming from. He's to maintaining your animal's health, um, having a vaccination program, making sure your animal is vaccinated and up to date on everything that it needs. Knowing common diseases it could be at risk for. If you have a dog that you use for breeding, then brucellosis is something that you want to have on your radar. Because if your animal is bringing money through breeding and it can also get a disease through breeding, then you want to make sure that your animal is not going to be at risk, that you're screening all of the stud males or all of the females that are going to be breeding so that it's not passed and your animal doesn't contract it. Um, preconditioning um, or just conditioning your animals for stressful situations. A lot of times people that own horses, um, before they actually get on their horse, they're going to take like basically like a string and they're just going to swing that around their horse. They're going to get close and they're going to move it in a circle, they're gonna get it behind them, they're gonna get it in front of them, so their horse gets used to all these different things moving around them and they're not freaking out. Um, think of like training for service dogs. They have to know how to react in different situations, otherwise they're putting themselves and their owner at risk. Making sure that everything is clean and sanitary, no fungus, no bacteria, um, good hand washing, making, just making sure that you're decreasing that chance of someone or something getting sick. Making sure you're taking your animal to the vet, getting that yearly physical exam, making sure they're staying healthy, making sure they're eating food that's good for them. Um, just doing your best to make sure that your animal is well taken care of. If they're an active dog, make sure that they're getting exercise. If you have a dog that wants to run laps, like a greyhound, and you put them in a tiny apartment, they're not gonna get that exercise. And you can end up seeing not only their behavior, but their body decline because they're not being able to do what they basically need to be able to do. And then when it comes to treating diseases, um, four different common ways to treat disease. We've got biologics. Drugs that are used specifically to treat different diseases. Antibiotics to kill bacteria and to kill some rickettsial and protozoal diseases. Anthelmintics used to treat internal parasites. This is just another word for dewormers. And treatment for diseases can be injectable. Think of like a vaccine. Oral, think of like dewormers, or topical, think like flea prevention that, or tick prevention that you put on the back of your animal's neck. So what you guys are gonna do, um, gonna come over to this assignment on different therapeutics. Um, we'll just move, perfect. Um, you are gonna go through different ways, different things to commonly treat um, or uncommonly treat different things. So when or where would we use vitamin and mineral supplements to help an animal? When would massage therapy for an animal be helpful to them? When would acupuncture be a good idea to try to treat something for the animal? You're just gonna go through these, Try to fill that out. Um, and then don't forget to also work on finishing these because between the external parasites and the zoonotic diseases we went over, you should have enough information to be able to answer the rest of these eight questions. Um, on Friday, I'm gonna end up posting, or have you got that you can look over, and I will probably end up posting some school net questions um, as a code 
for you to be able to go through and work on. So otherwise, let me know. If y'all have any questions, I miss you guys. I'm doing Zoom lunch every day from like 1 to 1.30. If y'all want to hop on, ask some questions, just say hey, like feel free to. I would love to see y'all's faces, but take it easy. Hopefully, I will get to see you guys soon.